everybody, my name is Michele Focchi. I am an assistant professor at the University of Trento and uh, I, work, I worked during 12 years uh, at IIT. Now I'm just collaborating with it. And IIT is Institute Italian Tecnologia, uh, which is located in Genova City. And it, it has a long experience in robotics. Uh, especially I was involved in the uh, development of legged robots in the dynamic legged system lab. I was a founder of this lab. Um, first I will give you a short overview on the possible application that I also see promising in the next years in the field of legged robots. Uh, these insights come also from talks I did with the end users that told me what are their needs. And the first application is inspection. I think this is something that is also related to a submarine robotics you work in and inspection and maintenance. Uh, for example, in oil and gas platforms and uh, uh, remote areas. So the idea is that we, we, send, we have a robot there, a quadruped robot, for example, that is patrolling and whenever something happens, the robot detects and uh, tells us what happened in such that the uh, rescue team uh, go there um, to fix the issue, bringing the necessary equipment to fix the issue and reducing the downtime of the platform, which is a lot of money. The second application is disaster recovery. Uh, think about an earthquake, collapse of the houses where you have survivals and you want to send a robot because a house can collapse on top of the, of the firefighter. Uh, also the contamination of toxic areas, um, uh, nuclear decommissioning for example. Uh, another application is uh, using these um, this, um, um, robots as, to flank humans as co-workers in handling objects, uh, transporting and uh, uh, human structure environment because these robots are able to deal with stairs, with ramps, with uh, unstructured terrain. And finally, something that came out very recently are space applications. Uh, this robot can be used in space exploration mission like to, I will see, I will show you in the uh, last part of the talk, uh, an application in crater exploration, planetary exploration but also in the construction of future infrastructure for humans, for example, in uh, uh, Mars, uh, uh, whenever we, we send um, uh, robots to Mars. Uh, I will show you here uh, um, an application of our, um, an animation of our first, uh, second prototype, IQREAL, uh, in nuclear decommissioning application. Here we see that the uh, advantage of legs uh, with respect to wheels to overcome unstructured terrain and uh, collapsed uh, debris. And uh, um, the robot is usually equipped with a sensor, visual sensor, that provides a map of the environment that can be used either for locomotion itself or also to navigate and create a map of the environment. The large range of motion allows the robot also to walk belly down and move through cluttered environments. So this is uh, one, uh, one example. Uh, <coughs> in terms of scientific challenges of uh, these robots, we have many challenges. The first one is that they are heavily constrained, which means they have actuation limits in terms of uh, uh, actuation power and speed limits. Kinematic limits in, the, in terms of range of motion because the legs cannot move more than the, uh, the end stop allows, and then also friction constraints. And in terms of friction constraints, we have two kinds of constraints. One is friction cones, that is a limit on the tangential force that a leg can apply on, uh, uh, in contact with the environment uh, without slipping, and unilaterality. What are unilater unilaterality constraints? It's the fact that the leg can only push, but not pull, okay? So the force can be um, relatively pushing. Um, all these constraints create a, a viability kernel, they limit the state area region uh, where uh, out of that uh, the robot can fall. So um, the second point is related to, uh, second challenge is related to dynamics that is unstable. So this robot are inherently unstable, they can fall, and if we see later, if the central mass goes out of the support polygon, it will diverge uh, and, and fall. Uh, the dynamic is hybrid, it's not differentiable, means that we have different dynamics depending on the contact situation. 
and it was also non-linear and so not convex and we, if you use this dynamics in an optimization problem we have the issue of local minima and so uh, problem different uh, solution with different initializations then uh, we have many degrees of freedom so a big state space we have in the case of part of a robot about 12 degrees of freedom usually three for each leg to locate the foot in the 3d space uh, and uh, for a humanoid we have even up to 50 degrees of freedom uh, all this um, high number of degrees of freedom in two trains uh, uh, create uh, an issue in of computation time if we use this robot for optimization because the state space is big uh, and we want to have a prediction horizon for example of one or two seconds to uh, be sure we fulfill the constraints and not fall and uh, because of the big number of constraints and the, um, and the uh, big uh, dimension of the state we have a big time computation time for the optimization while the, the challenge is that we want to have um, a low computation time in order to react to uh, what happens uh, and not fall. So uh, this is the outline of my talk. I first I will give you a brief overview on how do we model this kind of robots. Like the robots are a peculiar type of floating based robot, they belong to the big class, bigger class of floating based robots like mobile robot or drones and also submarine uh, robots, I think. And uh, uh, we have a uh, um, um, laser anymore. Uh, yeah, we have uh, in essence uh, single kinematic, kinematic chain structures that are the legs that branch out from a base link. Okay, uh, we don't have kinematic loops and uh, differently from fixed base robots that uh, Dagger robots came for because the base is under -treated. Uh But the good news is that we can still control the uh, base through the action of contact forces. So with contact forces. Uh, we can move around uh, the robot base and the leg of locomotion is all about uh, creating the right uh, pattern of contact forces to keep balance and uh, move in the, the right direction. Uh, there are different approaches to, to model this kind of robot. One is minimal coordinate and according to this approach you consider uh, different contact of contact configuration, for example, in the case of you know, humanoid, one leg on the ground, two legs on the ground, and the other leg on the ground, and you have different uh, fixed base manipulator uh, models for each contact configuration. This becomes uh, unmanageable in place of uh, quadruped robots because you have many need to deal uh, with switching of the model, and you have many combinations. A more elegant approach is that we use nowadays, uh, um, it's uh, to use uh, um, an excessive coordinate approach uh, where we use always the same number of generalized coordinates to describe the robot configuration. And we just constrain the system, we have a constraint according to the number of contacts that we have. Uh, so in the excess of coordinate uh, approach we have that accreted joint angles are not enough to describe the robot configuration of course and we usually do uh, add six degrees of freedom of virtual joints that describe the orientation and the position of the base link of the robot with respect to the workflow. So these uh, additional QB um, uh, joints uh, they uh, create the whole configuration of the robot together with the joint configuration. Hi. Uh, this um, modeling approach with the virtual joint works both with the uh, quadrupeds and also uh, with the bipeds. It's very generic for all the robots. Now, now let's have a closer look to how the floating base dynamics looks like. Uh, this looks very similar to the fixed base dynamics. We have the inertia matrix M, we have a, a joint acceleration um, Q dot dot, and the uh, terms of Coriolis and gravity terms in the H vector. Um, but because of contact uh, constraints, uh, we have that uh, contact force F appears on the right hand side of the equation that enforces the fact that, the, for example, a contact point like a foot is not moving. Uh, on the, on the, um, is not changing and if you differentiate these constraints at the velocity level you have uh, a constraint on the Jacobian 
times q dot equal to zero. Uh, the other point is that uh, uh, underlines this is a floating based robot is the fact that we have a selection matrix S uh, transpose that uh, tells us that the base uh, is under -fitted. so the torques are only affecting the lower part of the dynamics. So uh, as any floating base uh, system, we can partition uh, the dynamics into two parts. We have the upper part, that's the first six rows, that are the newton euler equations, um, that represent the uh, dynamics of the under part of the base, uh, um, of the floating base of the robot, while the actuated part is the bottom part, and uh, uh, as n rows. And we see uh, that we insert the contact forces uh, through the Jacobian J transpose, the transpose of the Jacobian, where the, uh, with, with J we consider the stack of all the contact Jacobian. So we, if we have four feet in contact, we stack all the Jacobians and we um, and we uh, we model the the uh, uh, constraint dynamics um, in this way. Uh, of course, the Jacobian maps joint velocity into twist at the end effector. In this case, the foot in contact, and uh, where we have um, twist, we have a linear velocity, an angular velocity of a foot frame. And in the case of a point contact, like in the case of a quadruped, we have the Jacobian has only three rows, so we have only linear velocity. And uh, in case of biped, because we can uh, also uh, constrain the orientation of the foot, we have uh, six rows. Uh, some important facts, if we inspect the uh, activated dynamics part, we see that the torques only of the joints only affect the, uh, the joint dynamics and don't have any influence on the floating wheels uh, until, unless the, uh, there is a contact force that appears with the environment. And on the other way, uh, on, the, on the other hand, the uh, floating base can only be controlled through the action of contact forces. But the contact forces on the B half are limited by physical law, by friction, what we saw before, and also torques are limited. So this means that we have limitations in the way the robot is able to move and control its central mass. So the whole locomotion problem can be split because of this structure in the floating base dynamics into two consecutive steps. The first is to uh, find a pattern of uh, contact forces to drive the, the underactuated uh, dynamics, so the base link around, and achieve the desired trajectory for the central mass. Then uh, compute the required joint torque trajectory uh, from the affected dynamics uh, given the contact forces under the hypothesis of non slipping uh, contacts. Now, let me give you a, 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 do a quick to the tour on a, a perception side. Um, because we have a floating base robot, we have some unobservable states, and in particular, the unobservable states are the linear position and linear velocity. So, we need an algorithm to the st uh, state estimation algorithm to get an estimate of these two quantities that we need to close the loop in our control. And the sensor that we use for state estimation is um, an inertial measurement unit that comprehends a magnetometer and an inclinometer to get the orientation of the, of the base, a gyro to get the angular uh, velocity, and an accelerometer to get the linear acceleration. We can have also vision sensor, either LiDAR, uh, laser, that give us a sparse 3D map, um, a sparse point cloud of the environment, or a, a, a GVD uh, a real sense, for example, an uh, infrared sensor, that uh, create a higher quality, but for in a smaller distance, high quality point cloud. Uh, we fuse all the inputs from this sensor uh, together in a Kalman filter. We also add uh, legodometry, which is very important because we can estimate the orientation of the trunk by uh, knowing which point are in contact, which feet are in contact, uh, to obtain the orientation through the measurement of the encoders at the joints. And we fuse them with an extended gamma filter uh, to get an estimate for the, uh, a more accurate estimate for the linear position and linear velocity. Recently, we acquired uh, this nice sensor, Intel T265, that does this uh, internally and uh, very, very, very accurately. And it's, it's a very nice uh, compact uh, uh, sensor. 
Then we use these uh, estimates from the state estimation uh, to merge the point cloud coming from the emission sensor to uh, obtain a 3D map of the environment. Because we need to add frame considering the fact that the robot will move uh, uh, between one, one moment and the other. And uh, um, we retain only a ball around this, this map to, to avoid the, uh, the issue of, 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 uh, of uh, memory uh, consumption. And uh, we return around only a lot of map because we want to use uh, this map for photo selection to avoid holes and avoid obstacles. Then, uh, now that we have a state estimation uh, uh, and we have a floating based robot uh, that we want to control, we need to have a strategy to control the stability because we said that the robot can fall. And this is a sketch of our locomotion framework. Okay. Oh, um, we have a user input from the user, for, for example, from Joypad or navigation algorithm that sends uh, high level uh, goals to a planning uh, module that creates the references for the trunk controller or whole body controller. And this is the uh, component deputed uh, to track the center of mass, uh, the reference for the center of mass and the orientation of the trunk and provide. Um, uh, the set point for the, of, of torques for the low level joint controller because in all these robots we want compliance so we have acting compliance implemented by a low level torque controller that allows us to, for example to create impedance uh, uh, behavior on the robot because if we, have, if we do just position control the robot will break we create very high impact forces and we need to be able to have a, a, a torque controller at the low level which makes it uh, not easy to control this robot because a torque controller is not it's not a straightforward thing. I, I worked many years just to make it make it work. Um, then we have uh, because the loop with state estimation algorithm to track the central mass, uh, uh, the desired central mass. <coughs> so the trunk controller uh, has two main purposes. Uh, one is to stabilize the trunk orientation, closing the loop with the with the IMU sensor, and the other one is to stabilize the central mass position. We see here that we are creating big disturbance motion and without any control of the central mass, the robot will be wobbling around. And it does uh, by solving an optimization problem, which is a quadratic program that computes the uh, contact forces and torques while taking account uh, some constraints, for example, the friction constraints or the application limits. So the key, control, the, <coughs> the key ideas of this trunk control is what? The separation we saw in the structure of the dynamics to control the base uh, the central mass uh, co uh, through contact forces. We cast the control problem as an optimization problem to find the optimal contact forces that now become the decision variable of our problem to control the base while fulfilling the friction cone constraints. We see here an application where we, we need to do this to be able to accomplish the task. Final step is from these optimal contact forces, map them into joint torques to send to the operators. The approach is general, extendable to any number of contacts with different topologies, so also annular terrain and frictional properties, so we can set a different friction coefficient for each foot. We see here on top what happens whenever we have no optimization of the contact force. In, in, in this task, the robot needs to actively push against the wall to have the contact forces inside the friction cone that now are inclined. While with the uh, optimization of the contact forces, the robot is able to load and unload the, the legs uh, while fulfilling the uh, contact force uh, friction cone constraints. An extension of this work is to uh, extend it to uh, a non-rigid uh, deformable terrain. We, in this case, we need a terrain compliance estimation that provides information on the compliance of the terrain that can be used uh, uh, in the whole body control, in the trunk controller, uh, relaxing where the rigid body con rigid contact assumption has been relaxed. And in here, we were the first one achieving this kind of task of uh, transitioning um, uh, between a soft and a hard surface, then considering the fact uh, uh, that the, the terrain is deformable.
Finally, uh, we come to the, now that we have the controller uh, ready, we come to the locomotion planning part, which is to provide these set points for the controller. So where do we want to move the central mass to keep uh, stable motion and uh, uh, achieve the correct uh, gait uh, that we want to realize? We started um, at the beginning implementing heuristic strategies that works very nice uh, uh, in practice. Let me give you first uh, a, a few insights on why uh, humanoids and why quadrupeds. Um, humanoids are, um, are preferred because of the, 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 they are suitable for human uh, environments, like for opening doors uh, or uh, climbing stairs uh, or um, manipulating objects. And they also have a psychological and commercial reason because they, they are human like appearance, so they are more empathic. Uh, to, to the end users. On the other hand, uh, quadrupeds have higher stability because they have a bigger support uh, polygon. Uh, we will see later what it is. Smaller feet, uh, usually you have a point like assumption, and uh, they can implement different kind of gates. So if you want to uh, be accurate uh, uh, crossing a pile of rubble or debris, we want to prefer to walk, otherwise, we want to move faster, we can choose a trot gate or a, even a base or a gallop. Uh, some basic terminology, so this, the convex, the super polygon is the convex out of the contact points and it looks like this, that is on the feet that are in contact, here is just starting to get the contact uh, here is on one foot, uh, here is releasing the contact with the left foot and here we have two feet in contact for a, for a human eye you see that the, the super polygon is quite small that's why it's more difficult to, to stabilize and for quadrupeds, we have the gate pattern, which is the set, the, the, the representation, the representation of what's, what's uh, leg are swinging uh, uh, at each moment. So each uh, gate, like a trot, is representing from a different gate pattern. And this is um, a trot where you move uh, diagonal legs alternatively, and this is a gallop gate. Or you, for example, can have a walk. And in case of quadruped, you can see that the super polygon, in the case of a four leg stance is a quadrilateral, is a big area. Then, whenever you swing one leg, it becomes a triangle, and whenever you touch down again, you become again a quadrilateral. So, this, this is a quite big support polygon. And here, uh, I show you an example of our first heuristic uh, planning experiments. We see here, here that the robot. Uh, crosses this uh, very complex terrain and these heuristics uh, allows me work very well and allows us to give uh, give us gave us precious insight on what are the focal points in locomotion on rock terrain and the focal points are three one is the adaptation of the trunk to the inclination of the terrain you see here that the, 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 the trunk is aligned and recovering from uh, replanning continuous replanning whenever there is a, a disturbance or a, a rock rolling at, a, at under the foot the robot replants the trajectory and the third one is the haptic touchdown the haptic touchdown means that whenever there was swinging a leg it will stop the motion of, only whenever there is really um, a contact achieved uh, and not stopping in the air or, or too late with the risk of injecting the stabilizing forces on the base uh, this is our uh, other results. We see here on the top left a uh, flying trot, wherever the robot is even with the four legs uh, on, the, on the air. And this is possible thanks to this torque control which implements active compliance uh, at the feet. Uh, we have disturbance rejection, we have a big, big, big boxing bag uh, hitting the robot and the robot takes a lateral step to keep stability. So we have push recovery modules, reactive modules, uh, always active that reacts only whenever an event like that happens and also we have the haptic touchdown that uh, uh, allows the robot to adapt to uh, very different features and, uh, and terrain. Uh, this is our simulation environment, it's very important, we test all the controllers working out all the issues uh, uh, early on in simulation before going on the, on, on the rear robot and we have uh, a simulation environment gazebo simulator and we can see here uh, the robot trotting on a ziggurat, uh, a very complex uh, uh, terrain and keeping the stability with all these modules, push recovery and, and, and 
trunk orientation adaptation active at the same time. And, and all of them are crucial to achieve the task. So the idea is we give high level command to the robot, uh, like go forward, go left, or, or rotate, and the robot will work it out autonomously, the, uh, the, um, the locomotion. Some more recent results, uh, um, I show you some platform we developed in our lab in, uh, in Genova at IIT. Um, <coughs> the, um, back in 2010, we had the first prototype of hydraulic quadruped robot, it's the second in the world after uh, Boston Dynamics one, that's called IQ, that stands for hydraulic quadruped. Then we have the uh, second version, uh, that is uh, IQ2 Max, that is a version that is able has a big range of motion, is able to self-right itself because if this robot falls because of some reason, it needs to be able to get up to fit. Um, we have a small version, Mini IQ. We started to investigate a central robot, uh, adding an arm, a 6-3 on arm to the robot, creating a central platform. Um, finally, the last prototype uh, is IQ Real, which is a um, completely power autonomous robot. And uh, some uh, um, a new one, a small one, a three kilogram, uh, 3D printed robot uh, solo uh, that is an open source uh, design from Max Planck that we use for research on jumps. And finally, the Alengo Unity Robotics. Uh, this is a Chinese uh, platform which works very nice. It is 22 kilograms, and uh, uh, we also use for for for, uh, for locomotion. Alcurial is a power autonomous wireless teleoperated completely untethered, so there is no harness here, robot that is designed for heavy duty application. We see here the task in 2019, we achieved um, yeah, to pull an airplane, creating a, a, a pulling force of to 800 Newton peak, and this is possible thanks to hydraulics. So we have an onboard pump, which is being miniaturized in, in, a, in a box of 20 centimeter. We have uh, uh, actuators, uh, that are 3D printed in titanium uh, to remove the excess of material and they are all integrated uh, through an intercut uh, uh, protocol, uh, real-time uh, protocol communication. Um, then, uh, moving out from heuristic, we want to generalize no, to uh, any kind of motion, uh, the planning of uh, our trajectory and also to um, any kind of terrain. That's why we move to optimization-based planning. And the advantage of optimization-based planning is that allows us to exploit models of the robot to predict the future behavior, and so take into account the fact that we have all these constraints to be fulfilled. Uh, we can be generic for any kind of gate and terrain, and uh, quickly recover from planning errors. In particular, these planning errors can be due to the fact that we use simplified model to generate this trajectory, we have to change changes in the terrain, for example, when a rock is collapsing under the foot, or, or disturbances, external disturbances like bushes. At the same time, the fact that we replan continuously we, uh, enables us to accommodate uh, to changes in the set point, uh, high level set point given by the user. Uh, here there are some guidelines on the optimization, uh, numerical optimization, um, that are the fact the horizon that we predict the uh, motion should be large enough to um, have enough anticipative behavior, so not too short. Uh, the, the planning frequency should be high enough to mitigate the accumulation of error and be reactive. And um, the discretization of the density of the discretization of the trajectory should be dense enough to capture the main robot dynamics. However, these two points, they increase the problem size a lot and so create, make the optimization lower and that's why we need to have a trade-off between accuracy and computation time. We cannot be too accurate, too dense discretization, replant too fast over too long horizon. For this reason, we uh, uh, roboticists uh, in the field of radar robot introduced lower dimensional model because uh, uh, they try to reduce the number of states because uh, the, the computation time is exploded with the number of states and constraints. So make optimization faster and be uh, able to uh, be carried out, carried out online. And among the most uh, famous model, we have a linear meta pendulum, which lives in a 2D space, uh, with a, that models a robot as a point mass, or the centroidal dynamics, uh, which is a 6D model, that models the robot as a single rigid body. And this one is the one that we, we choose to use 
um, and it captures the both the linear and angular dynamics uh, along with the generation of a 3D motion in space. Uh, on the same time, it allows, uh, because the input are ground action forces, it allows to express the friction limits as constraints. Here it is a, um, a, a, a block diagram of our um, uh, framework uh, with uh, uh, online uh, replanning optimization. We have a reference generation that generator that predicts some foothold, nominal footholds on the terrain during the, the, in the horizon, and these uh, are given as uh, references and parameters to the nonlinear. Um, uh, MPC, uh, so we iteratively solve a nonlinear problem in a predictive model predictive control rotation, and this, uh, using the active state of the robot, will produce uh, the references for the central mass and the contact forces that are given to the uh, trunk controller. And we managed to uh, uh, very nice uh, um, restructuring of the uh, equation and uh, of, of, of the implementation of this of this uh, NFTC uh, to run this uh, optimization, nonlinear optimization at 25 Hz on our robot with uh, 50 nodes and uh, which represent a 2 seconds horizon. And uh, that's why uh, the reason for which we uh, achieve this uh, performance is because you use a real-time iteration scheme and I can give you more details if you are interested in that. But let's go to the results. Uh, we were achieving an omnidirectional walk on rough terrain using a, a centroidal model um, for the optimization, uh, where we were uh, doing online evaluation of the terrain map. So we have the vision sensor that provides the terrain, and we were able also to um, uh, deal with the crossing a pallet, which is static but also moving pallet. So somebody was pushing the pallet in front of the robot, the robot was detecting, and it was creating the trajectory to uh, pitch up in order to overcome in a better way the pallet. And the optimization, the important point is the optimization of the trunk orientation was naturally emerging uh, from the optimization by optimizing the leg mobility. So we were trying to maximize the leg mobility and this makes such that the robot was uh, controlling the orientation uh, in an optimal way. Uh, finally, the last part of the talk is about uh, aerial motions. Um, aerial motions are important whenever you have uh, an obstacle that you cannot overcome with your usual uh, locomotion gate, like trot and walk. And I give you here some examples uh, of what we want uh, to achieve. Not really uh, something on the left, but we see that uh, on the right we have a dog which is able to achieve um, a very nice jump. So it's all about uh, uh, analyzing of what it does and try to mimic the nature. We saw that uh, we can uh, decompose the, uh, a jump in a thrusting phase, a lift-off phase, when the feet lose the contact with the ground, flying up phase, um, whenever it reaches the affect under the action of gravity, and flying down phase until it, we have an event of touchdown. And after the touchdown, we have a stabilization. And this is a very critical because if you jump and you don't dump all the energy in a nice way and in a, in a, in a, in a proper way, you can have fall or rebounds and uh, uh, waste a lot of uh, um, energy uh, to, 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 to recover. Uh, at the past, in the past, so we, the jump was implemented as an offline optimization. We were computing reference from a high level description of the task, like, for example, jump 20 cm forward or jump. 40 cm high and rotate, and we had just PD controller to, uh, to, to track these trajectories. So there was no uh, landing, uh, proper landing uh, dealing. Um, instead, we propose a different approach, which uh, still have a thruster model that computes the uh, optimal forces, pattern of forces to, uh, to accelerate the robot. Up, and then we have um, a landing controller that what it does whenever uh, is activated whenever the robot reaches the apex and moves the legs forward and backward such that it will uh, whenever it will touch the ground we will have 
a spring damper behavior and will, uh, like an inverted pendulum, will uh, end up with the uh, central mass on top of the foot. And this is like having an imper uh, a pendulum um, state on the unstable eigenvalue. Okay? So it's possible to recompute continuously the foot position such that whenever it will lands, it will nicely uh, uh, dump with a, as a spring and a damper and uh, on the horizontal um, dynamics we will end up with the central mass exactly in the foot without rebounds. So we um, implemented this, we see on the left uh, what happens with only the PD controller uh, it's very stiff and landing without any kind of, of, of smoothing and here you see that robot is perfectly able to uh, dump all the energy and uh, uh, land properly. This works for whatever kind of inclination, unfortunately I don't have a better uh, simulation because it's an early work, uh, but it should work also for blending of inclined terrains. Then uh, there is some work we, find we did recently is enhancing this aerial motion, adding some um, flywheels. Flywheels are just uh, rotating masses that, thanks to the conservation on, on angular momentum, and, um, allows the robot to control the orientation of the base, accelerating or decelerating these, these masses. Um, these masses can be uh, have, uh, um, uh, have an axis uh, parallel to the, uh, to the lateral uh, axis of the robot. In this case, they are only controlling the pitch. But if we locate this at skewed inclination, we can control summing up the angular momentum vectors only the um, um, the pitch, but uh, for the dis with the difference of the two vectors, we can control the roll. So we can tune the inclination of these flywheels to with the inertia of uh, different inertia in the roll and pitch direction, and achieve the control of both. This is uh, uh, um, some design studies on the on the uh, impact to design the structure of the flywheel. And here we have some preliminary simulations. Uh, we are the guys are just doing uh, experiments uh, now. Here is whatever we have no landing control, of course. The robot does a jump and forward and falls. So, even without a landing controller using the flywheels, the flywheel enable to help to stabilize. And uh, the flywheels can be used, for example, for uh, whenever robot needs to be reoriented. From, a, from an error in pitch or roll and be stabilized, so it's important for falling from height. And this is a simulation for with the low gravity, moon gravity um, um, uh, situation for space application where the uh, flywheel itself are enough to completely uh, create a solar salt. Finally, in the last part, I will report some results on two projects I worked in. One is the uh, uh, ENAI project, a uh, multi-million project uh, with the national insurance for work accident. Um, the goal was to develop a teleoperated sent-out platform to remove workers from dangerous areas and increase their safety. And uh, the second project is a project with the U European Space Agency in collaboration with Airbus uh, to develop an exapod uh, for greater exploration. In the inner project, we have integration, we have many groups working, uh, integration, integrating different technologies from locomotion to telemanipulations and uh, uh, human robot interaction. In particular, we have a field robot, a quadruped robot, uh, uh, with mounted on top a manipulator, and we have um, a, a haptic arm to, to teleoperate the robot and a virtual reality room, uh, a virtual reality, um, augmented reality uh, infrastructure. And uh, uh, the test that we have to do is from an external room, we control the robot to the place and we use the haptic arm to manipulate the objects. In particular, the experiment were to um, command uh, with haptic device to uh, uh, open a door and access fire equipment uh, and uh, also collect objects. Here you see the uh, haptic arm in the external room. Uh, remote uh, control room, and here is a uh, collection of the object.
the, uh, the project with the, instead of um, uh, with ESA, uh, the goal was creating a navigation system for future lag and robot uh, exploration. Um, uh, it was the, the output was to provide a code to support that support both quadruped and hexapods. And uh, in the demos, we were demonstrating um, traversing mixed slopes, pile of rubble, and also uh, consolidated rubble piles on inclined terrain. And the structure of the code uh, was uh, very modular. We have a guidance navigation module that provides uh, the mapping and the path, uh, the goals uh, for the low level, a lower level uh, locomotion controller, motion controller to, to achieve. That provides the, uh, as I said, uh, these are high level commands, velocity commands, and the, uh, goals. And these are uh, the, the sites where uh, what what. Uh, like to move, uh, how to uh, manage the touchdown and, uh, and, and do the control of stability and finally we have a, an abstraction layer, hardware abstraction layer which is independent from the control, from the kind of robot that is able to talk both with a quadruped robot and a, uh, an hexapod robot and a quadruped robot. And here is uh, some experiments on the pilot robot, the robot is an hexapod, it's called Crex, it's uh, a DFKI center Space Center in Germany, Bremen, and is able to uh, really overcome uh, very complex uh, uh, terrain with rubbles without getting stuck and do only directional walk. The robot was also shown uh, recently to uh, climb a crater of 30 degrees inclination without slipping. We have the whole controller going on there with friction cone estimation and, and, and optimization. And we did even more with the quadruped uh, achieving a climb uh, uh, of a 35 degree inclination round. This is the end of my talk. Uh, I'm waiting for your question. I hope you enjoy. And another point is that we are University of Trento. We are hiring. Uh, we have available five or six. Uh, PhD scholarship just this year because of the recovery program. We have many, many possibilities and that will be closing soon in July. So if you have students that might be interested into these topics, uh, please uh, let them.